lights are coming on this morning. Oh, how many are excited about the Lord Jesus today? Amen. Let me ask that again. How many are excited about the Lord Jesus today? Amen. Did you come for a word today? Did you come for the presence of the Lord today? Hallelujah. If you did, you came to the right place because Elvis has left the building, but God is in the house. Amen. Hallelujah. Blessed be the name of the Lord. If you've got the word with you this morning, let's go to Matthew chapter 26. And the Lord's given me a word for us this morning that I really believe is going to bless you if you'll dig in deep. Today, if you'll put on your holy bib in the Lord, amen, and pull out your plate and your fork, amen, and get ready to taste and see that he is good. If you're here today for a tickling of the ears, this is not the message for you, but if you're here today for a word, then you're here in the right place. Can I hear an amen? This morning, I want to talk about God's pressing place. This morning I want to talk about God's pressing place and this message really goes with the last few messages that have been delivered from this pulpit where we've been talking about things like the destiny of God and being in the in-between place and persevering in the Lord for what God has for us. Today we're going to talk about God's pressing place. But let me ask you a question. When you pray, where do you go for your time of prayer? Where do you go for your time of prayer? The Word says we need to be a people of prayer. Jesus was a man of prayer. We know he was the God-man, Son of God, Son of Man. And we need to be like Jesus. He was our template. Amen? He showed us the way. I mean, he was the pattern for us. And we want to be like him. Can I hear an amen? So therefore, we're a people of prayer. Paul said, pray without ceasing. So where do you go to pray? Do you have a prayer room? Do you have a prayer place? Is it behind the wheel of your car? (laughs) Where's your place of prayer? Because we all need a place of prayer. For some, it's the sanctuary. We've got a lot of key holders around here, and you've got to access the sanctuary. And some folks know when they want to pray, they want to get away from the distractions. So they'll come to this house and turn on some praise and worship and hit the prayer carpet, which is what we call this area, the prayer carpet. We praise here, we worship here, we pray here. Amen. We minister here on this carpet. It's a set-apart place. That's why you'll notice I'm not wearing any shoes. I don't wear shoes on the prayer carpet because it's holy ground. Can I hear an amen? Amen. The Lord said to Moses, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. Why? Because the Lord was there. Wherever the Lord is, it's holy ground. Can I hear an amen? Hallelujah. So that's why I don't wear shoes in this house. Hallelujah. Praise God. I've got good socks. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You can laugh at that. It's okay. But where do you go to pray? Where do you go to pray? When we study the life of Jesus, again, Christ is our template. The Lord had a place where he liked to go to pray. But you don't really discover it unless you really dig deep in the Word. Some would think maybe he went to the temple or maybe he went to the Mount of Olives or maybe he went to Gethsemane, the hill where he was going to be crucified. But if you dig deep in the Word, you'll find that there was a place that Jesus liked to go to pray and it was called the Garden of Gethsemane. In Matthew 26, Jesus is having his final prayer time in the Garden of Gethsemane. And some may think, well, it was a beautiful garden. Maybe that's where he wanted to go for his final prayer. Baloney. Jesus went to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray his final prayer here on earth because that was his prayer place. That was his secret place. That's where Jesus loved to go and seek the Father. So whenever Jesus was slipping away to spend time with the Father, the vast majority of the time, he was going to a place called the Garden of Gethsemane. And the Garden of Gethsemane, if you kind of picture Jerusalem here, and this would be north, and this would be south, kind of northeast of Jerusalem was the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives was where the transfiguration took place that we talked about a few Wednesday nights ago, where he took Peter, James, and John, and they saw Moses and Elijah up on the mountain. Why do they call that the Mount of Olives? Because at the foot of the Mount of Olives is the Garden of Gethsemane. And in the Garden of Gethsemane, they have thousand-year-old-plus olive trees in that garden. And they're kind of twisted-looking trees whose trunks are so massive that it'd take a couple of us to put our arms around them to be able to get around the circumference of those olive trees. 
There, the olive tree is not a weak tree. <laughs> it's a very strong tree, really, when you look at it. And it's a very sought-after wood. There were some of the items in the temple of the Lord that God said very specifically make out of olive wood, interestingly enough. But the Mount of Olives was called the Mount of Olives not because olives grew up on the mountain, because they can't in that atmosphere and environment. Because the more you went up the Mount of Olives, the colder it became to the point where there's actually snow believe it or not, at the top of the Mount of Olives. But at the bottom of the Mount of Olives was a beautiful garden that's still there today. It's the Garden of Gethsemane. That's where Jesus loved to go to pray. So how many know if Jesus had a place of prayer, we need a place of prayer? Can I hear an amen? We need that place that when things are going on in our lives, we escape to that place to pray. When Jesus was tired because the multitudes were pressing in and the enemy was attacking and all these things were going on, Jesus knew he needed to get to the secret place. He knew he needed to get to the Mount of Olives to get centered again in the Father. Amen? To connect with the Father again. He understood that true ministry is really an outgrowth of true intimacy with God. And I find it very interesting when Jesus gives the, the parable of the ten virgins. I find it very interesting that the wise virgins had lamps that were filled with oil. What oil was that? Well, we know back in that day it was olive oil, but it was a picture of oil, the oil of intimacy with God that you really get as you press into him. When the olive is crushed, the oil flows. Many ask God for a great anointing. But they don't realize that the only way the oil flows is if the olive is crushed. You see, while the olive is whole, it contains the oil and the oil can't flow. The oil, the oil only flows in the crushing the crushing began in the garden that night for Jesus before a blow ever hit his body, before the crown of thorns was ever thrust upon his head, before he was whipped with the cat of nine tails that wrapped around his flesh and then pulled it away violently, before the robe was ever put on him, before the nails ever touched him, before the cross ever lifted him up to fulfill his prophetic eternal destiny, we've got to understand the crushing really began in the garden and the crushing began when he said father if it's your will may this cup pass from me but nevertheless father not my will but thine be done is when the pressing began and the pressing doesn't begin in your life until you pray that prayer father not my will but thine be done because that's the moment that you disengage with the direction your life is going and you engage with the direction that God wants your life to go. Can I hear an amen? So if you're in Matthew 26, let's go to verse 36 and let's stand this morning to read the initial portion of the word of God today. Um, we stand not religiously, but we stand to honor the word of God, amen? <coughs> because Jesus is the word of God. John 1.1 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Amen. John 1, 26, and the Word became flesh and came and dwelt amongst us. Amen. Jesus is the Word, so we stand for him this morning. Notice what the Word of God says in, in Matthew 26, 36. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane. Gethsemane, again in the Hebrew, means the place of the crushed olive or the oil press. Amen. And he said to them, sit here while I go over there and pray. And guess who he took with him, church? Peter, James, and John. You see, as human beings, when we go through the crushing, we want those with us that are most dear. As human beings, when we go through the crushing, we find comfort in those that are nearest to us. Amen? That are closest to us. But how many know the one that should be the closest to us is the Lord? And when we go through crushing, we need to lay hold of him. But notice even Jesus that night, as connected as he was with the Father, he still wanted three people with him. Isn't that interesting? Peter, James, and John. They were the inner three, the inner circle, the ones closest to him except for the Father. Can I hear an amen? That was his closest relationship. 
Now notice what the word says. He took Peter and and the two sons of Zebedee along with him. We know the sons of Zebedee were James and John. They were once called the sons of thunder, but now they're two great lovers of God because they spent three and a half years with Jesus. And the word says, Jesus became sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Now, is Jesus saying, I want you to watch out because the enemy is coming? Was he saying, I want you to hold watch because they're going to come and they're going to take me? No, that word, keep watch, was literally another word for pray, for prayer. We're going to pray. Keep watch with me. In the Old Testament, the folks that were up on the walls watching over the city were called watchmen. And the Lord related those to intercessors being up on the walls praying. So when Jesus said, keep watch with me, he was saying, pray with me. Can I hear an amen? So he said, I want you to keep watch with me, the word says. Stay here and keep watch with me. Verse 39 says, going a little farther. So he left him at a place. And he said, keep watch with me. But Jesus understood he had to go somewhere on the journey that they weren't ready to go to yet. So he said, you stay here. I'm going a little farther. Are you catching this? They were going to go to that place eventually, but not yet. So Jesus went a little farther. How many know if you want more of Jesus today, you need to go a little farther? than what you've been going if you want a deeper relationship with him you got to go a little farther if you want more of him you need to go a little farther can i hear an amen so going a little farther what did he do he fell on his face on the ground and he prayed what do we call that today in the church we call it sucking carpet you got your face before the lord on the prayer carpet what did jesus do in this darkest moment he got on his face before god before the father can i hear an amen that's what we need to do when the crushing starts get on our face before god we need to not complain we need to not accuse the enemy we need to not accuse god we need to get on our face before the lord and cry out to him can i hear an amen see when the crushing starts god wants the oil to flow because he's going to take you to the next level the crushing takes you to the next level in the lord So those of you that have been praying for God to take you to the next level, if you're now in a season of crushing, he's answering your prayer. The challenges in the kingdom answered prayers don't look like what we think they should. (laughs) I want you to think about that one. Now notice what the word says in verse 40. Then he returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Hmm. But just prior to that, I noticed, I want you to notice what he said. Verse 39. Going a little farther, he fell on his face to the ground and he prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Now I find it interesting that the sons of Zebedee, a few chapters back, sent their mama to Jesus. And their mama asked Jesus, Jesus, when you enter your eternal kingdom, can one of my sons sit on your right hand and one of my other sons sit on your left? And what did Jesus say? He replied, number one, he said, that is not for me to give. But number two, he said, can they drink of the cup that I'm going to drink of? See, if you want to rule and reign with Christ, you've got to drink of the cup. The cup that he talked about in the garden that night is still a cup alive and well in our generation. And if you really want to rule and reign with him in eternity and on earth, you've got to be willing to drink of the cup. So what do you say? Father, if it's your will, may this cup pass. But nevertheless, Father, not my will, but thine. Can I hear an amen? By the way, James and John would drink of the cup. And we'll talk about that in just a few moments. So after Jesus goes to that deep level of surrender, verse 40, he returned to his disciples and found them fast in prayer. Is that what the word says? No, absolutely not. Notice what the word of God says. He returned to his disciples. He found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour, he asked Peter. 
Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body or the flesh is weak. He then went away a second time and prayed, Father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. How many know that cup was important? He mentions that cup twice to the Father. That was a verily, verily, I say unto you, so to speak. He mentions the cup twice. This was an important cup. Can I hear an amen? This was the cup that was going to bring us salvation. What was he really saying? Father, if there's another way, can we go that other way? But nevertheless, Father, not my will be done, but thine. But I find it amazing that Jesus really surrendered to the cup before he ever created the world. Because, of the book, because the book of Revelation calls him the lamb that was slain from the foundations of the world. Which means what? He said yes to the cup all the way back in eternity past. Then what was this in the garden? Was it wavering? No, I believe it was the human side of him counting the cost. And saying, Father, I know what's coming. We've discussed this many times before. Father, is there another way? You know all things, Father. But Father, nevertheless, my will but thine be done. See, in the place of the pressing is when you really surrender to God. Can I hear an amen? Notice what the word says, verse 43. When he came back, he again found them sleeping. Because their eyes were heavy. So he left them and went away once more and prayed a third time. And what did he pray? The same thing. He prayed about the cup three times. Now I find it interesting in the Hebrew that three is the number of unity. I really believe he prayed the prayer of the cup three times until his own body came into unity. <laughs> Before his own flesh finally came into agreement. Come on now with the plan of the Father and of the Spirit. Can I hear an amen? I believe the God side of Jesus was right there in agreement. But he had to get his flesh on board. <laughs> he had to get his body on board. How many know in your heart what God has for you, but you got to get the rest of you on board? Can I hear an amen? And what does he say? He says, the Spirit is willing. The God side of me is willing. The flesh is weak i got to get my flesh back in agreement with the plan here. Amen? Because now we're at zero hour. Now this thing's going to happen. Notice verse 45. Then he returned to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour is near and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Please be seated. Hallelujah. How many are excited about the Lord today? If you don't know this already, I want you to get the revelation in the Lord that you are a people of destiny. You are a people of destiny. If you take that word destined and you break destiny, you break it down, you get the word destined or destined. What does that mean? It means you have a purpose. It means there's a plan for your life. It means God, Jeremiah 29, 11, knows the plans that he has for you. Can I hear an amen? But if we're going to walk in the destiny, because God has destiny, I believe, for everybody. But if you're going to walk in that destiny, you've got to surrender to him. You've got to give your life to him. You've got to receive the gift of salvation. You have to be willing to walk through sanctification. You've got to be willing to be crushed. Not everybody is. The word says the Lord desires that all men would be saved and come into a knowledge of truth. But will they? No, Jesus said it's a narrow road that leads to heaven. And few are going to take it. He said the road to hell is broad. He said there's going to be a lot of people on that road. And as the Lord talked about salvation, at one point the disciples literally looked at him and said, Lord, can anybody be saved? Anybody ever read that before? Lord, can anybody be saved as you're talking about this? It's a narrow road. Can I hear an amen? If you're going to walk in the destiny of Christ, then you're going to have to walk like Christ walked. And as I look at the life of Jesus, there were three significant moments in his life. Three significant points of destiny that helped him fulfill God's purpose. 
And if you're going to work and fulfill God's destiny, God's purpose in your life, there's going to be moments of destiny that you're going to know when you're in them. This is, this is just one of those moments. This is a defining moment in my life. Maybe it's a moment where God gives you healing. Maybe it's a moment where God gives you deliverance. Maybe it's the moment where you finally say yes to him and go through a door. Maybe it's the moment where you teach for the first time because it's been prophesied over you. You have a gift of teaching and you're stepping out in faith. There are moments of points of destiny in your life. And I believe at the end of your life, if you connect them all together, those points led you to the plan that God had for you. Can I hear an amen? I really believe that in the Lord. I believe there's three very significant points of destiny in Jesus' life, and they're important for us to take note of. Number one, the first one was the wilderness. The wilderness is a place that we all have to go through. It's a place of testing. And it's a place where we learn the power of the Word of God. When the enemy came to tempt Jesus, what did Jesus do? He spoke the Word of God to him. What did Jesus not do? Say to him, Satan, well, you know, son of God here, <laughs> you don't know who you're messing with. Just get away from me, boy, you're bothering me. How many know that's not what he did? Satan came against him three times with three different opportunities. What did Jesus bring against the enemy? The word of God three times. You have to go through the wilderness as part of your destiny in the Lord. And by the way, you don't go through the wilderness just once. You go through the wilderness periodically. But in the wilderness is where we learn to fight the enemy with the word of God. And we emerge from the wilderness leaning on the arm of our lover stronger than we ever were before. Jesus was never the same after he came out of the wilderness. The wilderness for him was a place of fasting. Sometimes God calls us to fast in the wilderness. Definitely calls us to pray in the wilderness. Definitely calls us to search, search the word in the wilderness. Amen. The wilderness has a purpose. Can I hear an amen? Second was the cross. The cross was the place where his body was destroyed. The word of God said Jesus was not recognizable on the cross. Can I hear an amen? His body was that beaten, that bruised, and that distorted. Not only physically from everything he went through, but spiritually because he who knew no sin for our sake became sin. So that through him we could become righteous. Meaning what? On the cross he not only bore the affliction, he bore the sin. Can I hear an amen? You see, the cross is a place of dying. <laughs> the wilderness is a place of testing. The cross is a place of dying. <laughs> Can I hear an amen? The cross is a place that we go periodically also because the cross is a place where we learn to die. It's a place where we learn to die. Can I hear an amen? The third defining place for Jesus was in the garden. In the garden, he found a pressing place. In the garden, he found a pressing place. And this is a pattern for us in every season of our life in the Lord. What's going to happen? We're going to go through the wilderness and get stronger in the Word and empower the Word against the enemy. Then He's going to take us to the cross where our flesh dies a little bit more. Then He's going to take us to the garden where we're pressed and the oil flows. We need you, Lord. Speak to us, Holy Spirit. Is anybody getting this? Speak to us, Holy Spirit. We need you. Hallelujah. Is anybody getting this? And you're going to go over and over again from the wilderness to the cross to the garden. Can I hear an amen? From the wilderness to the cross to the garden. Well, Pastor, why, why do you put it like this? Well, I want you to see something. Cindy, would you give us John chapter 20 and verse 21? John chapter 20 and verse 21, I want you to notice something here in the Lord. I mean, we got to get this as God's people if we really want to go after what he has for us. Can I hear an amen? So Cindy's going to give us John chapter 20 and verse 21. What does the word say? And again, Jesus said, peace or shalom be with you as the father has sent me, 
I am sending you. Now, Cindy, could you give that to us in the Amplified, please? In the Amplified, the word says, Then Jesus said to them again, Peace be to you, just as the Father has sent me forth, I am sending you. What did Jesus really say here? Number one, shalom. What does shalom mean in the Hebrew? Nothing missing, nothing broken. Wholeness in your spirit, soul, and body. He said, I'm giving you wholeness. And by the way, as the Father sent me, so I send you. What does that mean? You're going to go through the wilderness, through the cross, through the garden. You're going to go through the wilderness, through the cross, through the garden. You're going to go to the wilderness, to the cross, to the garden. You're going to go to the wilderness, to the cross, and the garden over and over again in your life. Well, Pastor, why are you putting this in, not, in, in, the, in improper order? Because that's not the order in which these events took place. Well, it may not have been in the life of Jesus, but it's going to be in your life. <laughs> because the dying has to come before the pressing. The dying has to come before the pressing. So this may not be in the sequence of events, but trust me, it's in the sequence of your events. Amen? So we've got to understand this in the Lord. You know, I find it fascinating when, I start, when we start talking about the garden, I find it fascinating that in the garden, one of two things are going to take place. When God takes you to the place, the place of pressing, one of two things is going to take place. You're either going to press in, lay hold of him, surrender to him, and go to that place of crushing where the anointing flows, or you're going to fall asleep. And you're going to fall asleep. You see, there's some in the place of pressing that just check out. I don't want this. I didn't ask for this. This isn't the answer to prayer. This isn't what it's supposed to look like. And they leave the garden. They fall asleep. They fall asleep on their watch. And what does the word say in the book of Mark? The word says, when the master comes, don't let him find you sleeping. When the master comes, don't let him find you sleeping. See, in the garden, you're either going to check out, you're going to fall asleep, or you're going to be crushed. You're going to be willing to be crushed. What did Jesus say? He said, the rock is either going to fall upon you, and you're going to, or you're either going to fall upon the rock, he said, and be broken, or the rock is going to fall upon you, and you're going to be crushed. Church, I'd rather fall upon the rock and be broken. Amen. So really in the garden, you're throwing yourself on the rock and the oil is flowing. Don't make God have to drop the rock upon you. Can I hear an amen? Also, I find it fascinating that man began in the garden and man's rebirth began in a garden. Isn't that interesting? In the first garden, which was the Garden of Eden, we had the first Adam in the Garden of Eden, and what was Adam's final prayer in the Garden? Father, not thy will be done, but mine. And he ate of the apple. Are you catching this? And what entered into the world through one man's sin? Sin <laughs> entered in the world through his action. Isn't it fitting that he begins the process of death in a garden? See, the second Adam in a second garden, prayed the right prayer. Father, not my will, but thine be done. And that was a new beginning for mankind. That was the beginning of a new covenant opening for us. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Cindy, can you give us 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8? 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. I want you to see what the word says. 1 Peter 5, 8. We keep the word handy today because we're going to look at some things that I really believe that God wants to show you. I want you to notice what the word says here. And Cindy, can we see that in the NIV first? Why don't you want to fall asleep in the garden? Well, the word says, be self-controlled and alert, for your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for somebody to devour. Don't let him find you asleep in the garden. 
you're going to get devoured. So what do we need to do in this hour? We need to be awake and we need to be on watch. We need to be praying. While the crushing is taking place. Can I hear an amen? While the crushing is taking place. Cindy, what does that say in the Amplified? I want you to notice this, church. It's so important for us to get this. Be well balanced, temperate, sober of mind. Be vigilant and cautious at all times. For that enemy of yours, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion in fierce hunger, seeking someone to seize upon and devour. How do we stand firm? How do we remain, remain controlled and temperate? It's by being a person of prayer. Jesus understood when he started getting a little raw, he needed to get to the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus understood when he started feeling a little tired, he needed to get to the Garden of Gethsemane. How many have noticed in your life when you start getting tired and worn down is when the roaring lion shows up? That's when he shows up. He ain't going to show up when you got that sword sharpened and that, that shield up oiled and you're all ready to go waiting for him no he shows up when you're tired so what did jesus do when he was tired he went to the place of prayer because he knew in the place of prayer there was safety there was protection there was covering so what does he do on the eve of the most violent death that was ever known in the history of mankind he went to the place of prayer and in the place of prayer the crushing began what did the prophet Isaiah prophesy? It pleased the Father to crush him. Why did it please the Father to crush him? Because he knew when the Son was crushed, the oil of salvation would flow. Can I hear an amen? The oil of anointing would flow. The oil of the new covenant would flow. Is anybody getting this? It happened when the olive was crushed. Can I hear an amen? We've got to understand this in the Lord. As the Father sent me, so I send you. Somebody, please, say amen. Hallelujah. And I tell you what, if you've never been in the pressing place, then you don't know what it's like to pray the same prayer over and over and over again. Jesus prayed the cup before the Father three times in one prayer session. Three times in one prayer session. See, it's in the pressing place where there's something on you that you just keep bringing to God over and over and over again. And you bring it to God until either God moves or God moves you. Can I hear an amen? See, if you've never been in the pressing place, then you don't know what that's like. If you've never been in the pressing place, you don't know what that's like. Can I hear an amen? But this is what we have to understand in the Lord. Hallelujah. It's in the pressing place that God speaks to us. It's in the pressing place that he reveals his heart to us. Can I hear an amen? See, this is what we have to understand in the Lord. <laughs> Many times God shows us the beginning and he shows us the end, but he doesn't show us the middle. Why doesn't he show us the middle? I believe he doesn't show us the middle because the middle is the place where many people give up. The middle is the place where many people get over-challenged and overburdened. But God designed the middle place to be the pressing place that causes us to go to the Garden of Gethsemane and go deeper than ever before. By the way, if God showed you the beginning, the middle, and the end, you probably wouldn't want to go on the journey. Because the middle place is the tough place. But remember the message a couple Sundays ago? There's beauty in between. The middle place is the in-between place. Remember Paul says, I let go of the past and I reach out towards the future, the high calling of God on my life. Then where is Paul standing in order to do that? Right in the midst of the present. And many in the church today either are stuck in their past in mourning over all the junk that went on and they're listening to the enemy who's saying that disqualifies them for what God has for them 
or they're so looking forward to heaven and everything that's going to happen in heaven that they're missing the middle place right now. They're missing what God wants to do right now in their lives. And if you're not willing to go to the Garden of Gethsemane, the pressing place, then you're not going to go to the next place that you really want to go to in the Lord. You cannot skip the Garden of Gethsemane on this journey. Now you can hold out and not go in and get stuck. But you can't skip the garden. If Jesus couldn't, and he said, as the Father sent me, so I send you, then you can't either. See, the problem is many people get disillusioned and they give up in the middle. That's the problem. You know, it amazes me today what people spend on weddings. Weddings and funerals. <laughs> it amazes me what people will spend on them. Weddings especially. Do you know there's people now that will spend twenty five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 on a wedding? Yeah, Holly just said hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, there are now, you know, parents of the bride just offering a check for them to elope because weddings are so expensive. I kid you not, I've known more than one couple where the parents just added up how much it was going to cost for the wedding and just said, I'll give you a check for this amount if you just elope. I mean, they're, they're that expensive. But it's amazing to me, everybody at the marriage altar always pictures that 25th wedding anniversary, that 30th wedding anniversary, that 40th wedding anniversary. They always picture a beautiful ending. They don't really think about what happens in the middle. And in the middle is where some marriages don't make it. In the middle is where you have to learn how to die because marriage is about dying. It's about two selfish people coming together and dying and learning how to serve each other and meet each other's needs. I've had more than one couple in, in couples counseling, marriage counseling, and they're on opposite ends of the couch because they're on opposite ends of the marriage. And they're each saying, well, pastor, she's not meeting my needs. And, he's, and, and, and she's saying, pastor, he's not meeting my needs. And you've got two people wanting their needs met but not willing to meet the other's needs, not realizing that they'll get their needs met in meeting the other person's needs. You see, we always think about the beginning. It's not the middle that we think of. Because in the middle is where it's tough. In the middle is where it's difficult. In the middle is when that company, that couple that was so in love, and they envisioned the 25-year wedding anniversary while they were at the wedding altar. It's where, those, where the couple has to look at each other and commit to each other, you know what? If I wake up tomorrow morning and I look at the back of your head in bed, and I think to myself, I don't love this person anymore. I'm going to honor the commitment that we made at the altar, knowing that love can ebb and flow. And I may not exactly be feeling it today, but I know I'm going to feel it again soon. So I'm going to stay in what I've committed to. What was Jesus saying in the garden? Father, I love my bride. I want her with me for all of eternity. But, woo, I'm looking at the back of her head right now. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm looking at the journey. I'm looking here at what needs to happen in the next 24 hours. I'm looking, Father, at, at how much this is going to cost me. Father, is there another way? But, Father, nevertheless, I promised you at the altar of eternity past that I would marry her. And I would give my life for her. So I'm going to keep that commitment, Father. Is anybody getting excited about the Lord? See, we, we've got to understand this. It's the uncertainty of the place in the middle. It's the uncertainty in the place of pressing that causes people to give up. That causes people to let go. That causes people to get up at 3 in the morning and wonder where in the world is my life going. Anybody ever had that morning? You're up at 3 in the morning. You can't just go back to sleep. You're thinking about <coughs> all the cares, all the worries of life. I'll never forget a year after college, I bought my first home. God had blessed me with my first real job out of college. Wasn't working at the grocery store anymore. Was a college graduate. had a good job, and I bought my first home, signed on the dotted line for a mortgage. I'd never had anything but a small car payment up to that point. 
Now I've got a $100,000 plus mortgage. And I can remember a few nights waking up in the middle of the night thinking, how am I going to pay this off? Where is this money going to come? Does anybody know what I'm talking about? God, where is this money coming from? I'm being blessed now, but God, what's going to happen next year? God, what's going to happen in 10 years? You know what's going to happen? God's going to take care of you just as much then, if not more. (laughs) Hallelujah. Than he is right now. And what we shouldn't be doing is being up in the morning worrying. We should be up in the morning praying. We should be up in the morning with the olive being crushed. We should be up in the morning believing that God has got us. Can I hear an amen? We need to understand this. The Garden of Gethsemane represents the process of man's will coming into alignment with God's will. When you're in the Garden of Gethsemane, God is getting your will in alignment with His will, and He's doing it through crushing you. We live in a seeker-sensitive age where the church teaches that God is only love, grace, and mercy. Where we don't teach that God is jealous. We don't teach that God disciplines. We don't teach that God gets angry. We don't teach a balanced God in the American church. We really don't, which is why then when God shows up in a way we don't expect, we go, that's not my Jesus. The Lord's upset about something, that's not my Jesus. He's all love, mercy, and grace. The Lord comes and wants to discipline something in your life to get you back on track. That's not my God. He's all love, mercy, and grace. He also gets angry. He also gets jealous. Where do you think the realm of human emotion comes from? From God. I mean, we've got to understand this. He'd say to Israel at times, I am so jealous over you because you promised commitment to me at the altar and now you're with other lovers. You're worshiping the Baals and the Asherahs and Molechs and all these other things. I'm jealous for you. I'm so jealous. I'm going to let a foreign army come and defeat you and take you into slavery so that you will then repent and cry out to me so that I can come and rescue you. I'm sorry, but that's not the gentle shepherd. That's our jealous God. That's who he is. And by the way, even the gentle shepherd carries a staff. And the end of that staff is rounded because he'll put it around the sheep's neck and he'll pull it to get that sheep where he wants that sheep to go. And by the way, He's not coming back full of mercy and grace. He's coming back as the conquering king. (coughs) Is anybody getting this? The church has got a shift with what God is about to do in history. What is God about to do? Come back as the conquering king. That's why we've got to allow Jesus to begin to be the king in our life. Too many people in the American church have a gentle savior. We need to receive Jesus as our king. Can I hear an amen? So it's in the garden where the king gets your will in alignment with his. Here's the way to put, put, here's the way to look at it. How many here like clocks? Some folks just seem to like them, have house full of them. Some people collect clocks. Well, clocks are all about time. Amen. So you know what happens? You go into the garden of Gethsemane and God's hand is on the twelve. And you're the other hand coming across. And there's crushing and there's hurting. And you're out here, man. And there's crushing and there's crushing and there's crushing. But what's God going to do eventually? Get you in alignment with his hands. Can I hear an amen? And what happens in those old clocks when both hands come into alignment? The bells start ringing. Amen. The rejoicing starts happening. It's a new hour! Get alignment, get in alignment with the Lord and you're going to come into a new hour. What did God say in that word we received at the end of December 2017? My alignment, my alignment, my alignment. The garden is the place where you get in alignment with God. Your will with his will, not his will with yours. Can I hear it, amen? That's part of the reason why this church is being crushed right now. That's part of the reason why this church is being crushed. When you're being crushed, you can either fall asleep or you can get with God's will. What are we going to do? I say we get with God's will and we press in and we pray and we believe the best days of this church are yet ahead of us. 
Amen. And we've got to realize that our God knows the end from the beginning. We're so worried about the middle, God's got it covered. Can I hear an amen? Let's look at Isaiah 46.10. How many are enjoying this word today? I mean, receive this word in the Lord. It's not an easy word. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> By the way, let's start in verse 8. I love verse 8. Isaiah 46, 8. I'm going to give you a chance to get there. I've got my preaching Bible with me today. I take it with me everywhere. I've had it for over a decade. Passages just seem to fall open. Anybody have that Bible? Then he used another Bible, and it's just like, where in the world? How can I get to this passage? Notice Isaiah 46, 8. Remember this. Fix it in your mind. Take it to heart, you rebels. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God and there is no other. I am God and there's none like me. I make known the end from the beginning. From ancient times, what is still to come. And I say, my purpose will stand and I will do all that I please. <coughs> That's your God. Can I hear an amen? In the middle, in the place of pressing, we've got to quote Isaiah 46, 8 through 10. And when the enemy starts speaking, because church, let's be honest, the garden is a lonely place. Jesus took his three, <laughs> Jesus entered the garden with the 11. Judas was with the high priests at the time. He dropped off the 11 at a certain point and out of that 11 took with him three. Then he left that three at a point and he had to go on alone. In the garden, there are some things that God takes you through that's just you and God. There's a crushing that God takes you through that's only you and him. It's a lonely place. But in that lonely place, we have to go out and say to ourselves in the lonely place, my God's will is going to be accomplished. He sees the end from the beginning. Do you know what the problem is with man? We see the beginning to the end. You go to a movie, what's it start with? The beginning. What's it wrap up with? The end. That's the way we are, and that's how we look at seasons. That's how some people look at marriages and relationships. I mean, it is what it is. We see beginning to end. If God sat you down and showed you his movie of your life, guess what he'd start with? The end. And he'd show you at that place that he knew you were going to get to. He'd show you as the finished product filled with his glory. Because Christ in you is the hope of glory. He would show you the end point where you are the glorious bride without spot and without wrinkle. And in our humanness we'd go, God, how did I get there? And he'd say, well, I'm the only way you got there. But now let me run the film back and let me take you into the middle and all the way back to the beginning where I knew you before I ever put you in your mother's womb. See, if we could see it like God, God sees it, the middle's no biggie to God. Even as Jesus prayed three times, Father, may this cup pass for me if it's your will. Father God wasn't concerned about the middle. <laughs> Father God was just encouraging him, Son, finish the assignment. Son, finish the assignment. Son, finish the assignment. I know it's going to be painful. I know your blood's going to be shed. I know that you're going to be crushed. I know that people are going to betray you. I know that people are going to hurt you. I know that people are going to wound you. I know you've never known a sin. You've stayed holy for me. But now you're going to bear the sin of the world. You're going to be treated unjustly. You're going to have an unfair trial. All these things are going to happen to you, son. But finish the race. And remember, I am with you always, son. 
I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. In the place of crushing, the only one worried is us. <laughs> it's not God. Because God sees the finished product. We're so worried about right now. But what did Solomon say, the wisest man that ever walked in the earth? In, in Proverbs chapter 3, in verses 5 and 6, he said, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Acknowledge him in everything, and he'll make the crooked path straight. What's he saying? Trust God in the garden! Your great, 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 grandpappy may have blown it in the garden. When he said, Father, not your will, but mine be done, and he ate of the apple, but you now have my DNA. You just pray, not my will, but thine be done. And I'm going to get you to the ending that I saw before I ever put you in your mother's womb. But God, this has happened. God, this has happened. God, this has happened. I've already covered it in the blood. But God, what about this and what about that and this mistake and that mistake and this failed marriage and that? I've already covered it in the blood. Stop looking at the beginning. Stop focusing on the middle. You'll be who I've called you to be. Just stay where you are in the crushing. Let the oil flow. Let the oil flow. Let the oil flow. In biblical times, the first crushing of the olive was the purest, thickest, densest oil that would come out of the olive. That oil was used to anoint prophets, priests, and kings. Isn't that beautiful? The second crushing of the oil went to fill the menorah in the temple so that the light could burn. Church, every crushing has a purpose. Every crushing has a purpose. You got down into the fourth press of the olive and it was for cooking and medicinal use. Every crushing of the olive has a purpose. Church, if you're going to do it Jesus' way, you're going to be crushed. If you think you can navigate the garden without a crushing, if you think you can go through this Christian walk without a crushing, you don't understand it. In the middle of the garden, you've got to go, Jesus is my template. In the middle of the garden, you've got to go, as the Father sent me, so I send you. At the middle, in the middle of the garden, you've got to say to yourself, Jesus didn't give up on me, so I'm not going to give up on his plan. In the midst of the crushing, the enemy's going to say, look who's betrayed you, look who's left you, look who's done this, you're all alone, where's your God? That's where we say to him, my God is in the crushing and his will will be accomplished. If he didn't love me, he wouldn't crush me. Ooh. If he didn't love me, he wouldn't crush me. Can I hear an Amen. You know, many times we wish that God would adjust himself to meet our will and to meet our need. We've got to realize that God knows us better than ourselves. And if we'll surrender to his will, what he has for us is better than what we could ever come up with on our own. And by the way, when I look at the major discombobulations of my life that lie in the past, the vast majority of them were because I thought I knew better than God. I want to marry this person. I want to have this. I want to do that. I want to be this. But when I finally laid it down to the Lord, the Lord took me on a pathway that has been strewn with oil coming from crushing. A prophetic person that I once knew uh, and spent a lot of time with put it this way. They said to me one day, Andrew, it's a blood-stained road that you're called to. It's a blood-stained road. You ever watch a movie where somebody gets shot or cut and they're trying to get away and they leave a trail of blood? That's what this thing's going to look like if you do it God's way. You're going to leave a trail of, from crushing and that trail, once it's completed, 
if you saw it from end to beginning, helped you become everything that he always knew you would be. Do you receive that in the Lord? See, the truth is that in the pressing place, it's our turn or our time to learn how to work with God because he knows the end from the beginning. That's why I believe the word says it's good to wait upon the Lord. Can I hear an amen? What's going on in the waiting? The crushing. What's going on in the waiting? We're realizing that we're finite, but he's infinite. Can I hear an amen? Hallelujah. What we need to understand is this. Jesus didn't go to the Garden of Gethsemane to get the download from God on how the story was going to end. He already knew. Can I hear an amen? Why did Jesus go to the garden? To get strength in the middle. To get strength in the middle. See, we don't go to the garden so we can find out what the end is. He's already told you what it is. You're going to rule and reign with him for all of eternity. You're the spotless bride without spot and without wrinkle. You're a wise virgin with wick trimmed. I mean, come on, folks. He's already told you what you're going to be. You're going to be in his image. You're going to be like him. You're going to have fulfilled his purpose in your generation. You already know the end. You desperately need him for the middle. You go to the garden just like Jesus. Jesus knew what was coming. You go to the garden, you know what's coming, but you don't know how it's going to happen. You don't know how you're going to get there. You don't know what door to go through. You go to God because you need God so desperately in the middle. <laughs> Anybody remember that old show, Malcolm in the Middle? We need Jesus in the middle. Because that's when we get to the garden. The garden is a lonely place. It's a desperate place. It's a crushing place. Yet it's a beautiful place. Because your crushing in the olive flowing is beautiful to Jesus. What did the word say in Isaiah? But it pleased the Father to crush him. So what does it do to Jesus when we're being crushed? It pleases him. Do you know when the olive is crushed and the oil flows, there's a fragrance that comes forth. You can smell the olive oil. It has a very distinct smell to it. The smell of the crushed olive is sweet in his nostrils. It's sweet to him. Why? Because it's like a fragrance of the past that he recognizes. He remembers the fragrance of his own suffering. And now you're going through the same suffering for his sake. He smells it and it's beautiful to him. Well, pastor, I don't know if I like this message or not. Well, like it and live it, folks, because this is the way it's going to look like. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> Part of our problem is, though, we don't like to wait. We get in the garden and the crushing comes and we start thinking this automatically. How can I get through the process so I can get to the happy ending? Can I hear an amen? <laughs> Folks, I'm telling you what, the garden's part of your happy ending. Because the garden is part of the ending of you and the beginning of God in you. Can I hear an amen? I mean, we've got to see this for what it is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We've got to realize that in the wilderness we're tempted. At the cross we die, but in the garden we're crushed. In the garden we're crushed. And I'm going to argue, I think, a very important point for us in this message today. And the point is this. Many of us have prayed a dangerous prayer to the Lord out of the life of Paul. Lord, I want to know you, not only in the power of your resurrection, but also in the fellowship of your suffering. Remember I mentioned the garden's a lonely place? Oh, everybody wants to be with you in the power of your resurrection. 
everyone disappears in the fellowship of your suffering. Even Jesus is, at one point in his ministry looked at the disciples and he said, are you going to leave me also? See, he stopped with the miracles and he, he stopped with the prophetic. He stopped with the signs and the wonders. All these things that drew people to him except those who really had a heart to love him. They were drawn for the right reason. He started preaching the cross. He started preaching the suffering. He started preaching the crushing. And the multitudes of thousands went, Choo! they were gone. The same thing happens in a message like this. If this message today was preached in a church that had thousands upon thousands upon thousands in it, and we could watch spiritually what was happening in people's hearts as the message was delivered, you'd see many people who never left their seat, but their heart went, choo, and they were gone. Because they loved the Jesus of the resurrection. They loved the risen and anointed one, the powerful one, the prosperous one, the loving one. They loved that. But they're not willing to go into the Garden of Gethsemane and pray and to be crushed. See, they want the power of the resurrection. Bam! But they don't want the fellowship of the suffering. And I can guarantee you in this final hour that we're in, you're not going to get the power if you're not willing to suffer. Because as the oil flows, there's an anointing that comes out of you through suffering that comes out no other way. And it's the purest press of the oil. It's the densest. It's the most valuable. How many are willing to receive that? But church, when you go into the Garden of Gethsemane, don't be surprised if a group comes in with you, but then part of that group disappears. Then another part of that group disappears. And before you know it, it's just you and the pierced one. And you're crying out, Lord, I don't know if I can do this. If it's your will, let this cup pass. And you pass the cup back to him. And in love, he gently smiles. And he says, you can do it. And he pushes the cup back towards you. You know, James and John send their mama to Jesus and have Jesus ask in eternity if one can sit on his right and the other on his left. The Lord said, this is not for me to give. And he asked mama a question, can they drink of the cup that I'm going to drink of? And then he says, mama, they will drink of the cup that I'm going to drink of. You look at that group, Peter, James, and John, and you look at what they went through. I find it very interesting when you look at the sons of, of, Jebedee, of Zebedee. James was one of the first apostles to go. And Paul was, or, and, and John was one of the last. Isn't that interesting? In fact, James, who Jesus would bring on all these encounters with the other two, was only going to make it into the 12th chapter of Acts. And in the 12th chapter of Acts, he was going to be beheaded. He was going to be one of the first to die. He was going to drink of the cup. Peter, who never seemed to get it right, was going to die right in the middle of the group. He was going to be crucified. And as they crucified him, he was going to say to his Roman crucifiers, he was going to say, I'm not worthy to die like Christ died. Crucify me upside down. Crucify me upside down. And Paul was going to die on the Isle of Patmos. I'm sorry, John. John was going to die on the Isle of Patmos getting revelation from God. Yeah, they were going to drink of the cup. They were going to drink of the cup. James had a Roman that had captured him, a Roman soldier. And that Roman soldier received Christ 
before James was killed. It was the Roman soldier that was to put his head on the block so that he could be beheaded. That Roman soldier, through James's testimony, got saved. And as James' neck was laid out across the block, that Roman soldier took off his helmet and put his head on the block also and said, if you're going to kill him for the cause of Christ, then you're going to have to kill me also because I believe in the very one that he's dying for. Could they drink of the cup? You bet they could. Will you drink of the cup? Absolutely you will. You may not be crucified. You may not be boiled in oil. You may not have your head cut off. But this pathway will cost you. This pathway has already cost me things that I never thought it would cost me. But for me to live as Christ and to die is gain. And I want to stand before the Lord and not have him ask me, why did you experience or pursue pleasure, success, wealth, power, instead of me? I want him to look at me and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You fulfilled my purpose in your generation." Never going to get there unless you go through the garden. You got to go through the garden. You've got to be crushed. Can I hear an amen in the Lord? Is anybody willing to receive what God is saying today? Church, I'm here to tell you, we've got to pray through the pressing. We've got to pray through the pressing. I want you to see something. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. I want you to see something here in the Lord. Hallelujah. God bless y'all. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I want you to see what the Word says. So 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to look at verse 7. How do you stay in the garden? (laughs) How do you stay in the place of pressing and crushing? Number one, you got to (laughs) pray. Can I hear an amen? But number two, look at at 2 Corinthians 12, 7. To keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing great revelations that God has given me. There has given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I, I pleaded with the Lord to take it from me. Does that sound familiar? How many times did Jesus ask the Father to remove the cup? Three times! How many times did Paul request that the thorn be taken from him? Three times! After Jesus' third prayer in the garden, his flesh was in alignment with the will of the Father. I believe after Paul prayed the third prayer for release, his flesh was in alignment with the will of God. Now I want you to notice what the word says. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it from me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. In the garden, number one, we've got to pray. In the garden, number two, we've got to realize his grace is sufficient. What is grace? Some would take grace to the Greek and Aramaic and call it unmerited favor. I think that's great. I love that definition. But grace is also the power to overcome. It's the power to overcome. So in the garden, when we feel like giving up, grace, I need power to overcome. Grace. Grace is not an excuse for sin. It's power to overcome sin. It's power during the crushing. It's steadfastness during the suffering. Can I hear an amen? What's the third thing that we better understand in the garden? For my power is made perfect in weakness. The garden has to be a place of prayer. It has to be a place of grace. It has to be a place of our weakness and God's strength. 
That's how you get through the crushing. That is how you get through the crushing. That is how you get through the crushing. Can I hear an amen in the Lord? By the way, if you have not become sober yet in this message, if you know what I mean, if you've not already been taken to the bowels of your experience in the Lord yet, as we're talking about the garden, we've got to realize that sometimes a happy ending in the Lord doesn't mean that we get everything that we want. Sometimes a happy ending in the Lord is walking with God till we come to a place that the pressure doesn't bother us as much anymore. Because I'm going to argue the closer you get to the Lord, the more you dwell in the garden. And it really gets to a place where you're just in the pressing all the time. But through prayer and his grace and his strength, the pressing doesn't bother us as much anymore. Take comfort in that. How many here want the oil of the Lord, the anointing to flow from you all the time? Then you're going to be pressed all the time. Not depressed, pressed. There's a difference. (laughs) I just heard the Holy Spirit say that. Can I hear an amen? And God's going to give you grace for every pressure in your life. Grace for every tragedy in your life. Grace for every difficulty in your life. Grace for every challenge in your life. He's going to give you grace. He says, my great grace is sufficient for thee. Somebody say that whether you're in the sanctuary or you're at home. His grace is sufficient for me. But church, we also need to realize this. After the temptation, the death, the pressing, comes the resurrection. And we're raised up in new power and new authority in Christ. Can I hear an amen? I want you to notice what the word says. Let's go to Matthew chapter 28. Let's go to Matthew chapter 28. Are you enjoying this word today? Matthew chapter 28. And we're going to look at verse 18. I'll give you a second to get there. This is precious word today. We've got to receive this word today in the Lord. Amen. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 28 verses 18 to 20. And we're going to close with this today. The word says this. And then Jesus came to them and said. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. How much? What does he give you when you're willing to be crushed in the garden? All authority. All power in heaven and earth. By the way, he doesn't trust you with the keys until you've been crushed in the garden. And I'm not talking one crushing. I'm talking a continual crushing. Why? Because the you now is ebbed out of you and the Holy Ghost flows when you're crushed. You see, in your first few crushings, when God's crushing you, you were coming out of you. But as you're willing to be crushed more, there's a metamorphosis that takes place. And suddenly where all that ick and yuck and junk were coming out before, now there's precious oil coming out. Hey! Somebody get excited in the Lord. And after the crushing comes a resurrection. All authority in heaven and earth have been given unto me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I am with you always. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
and even until the end of the age. So the garden's a place of prayer. The garden's a place of grace. The garden's a place of what, church? Crushing. The garden is a place of weakness. But the garden's also a place of obedience. And teaching them to obey. <laughs> you can't teach anybody to obey if you haven't learned to obey yourself. Because you can teach people what you know, but you can only reproduce what you are. See, we come out of the garden having learned obedience through suffering. Isn't that what the Word says of Christ? He learned obedience through suffering. <laughs> he learned obedience through buffering. <laughs> Did he not? And as the Father sent me, so I send you. So you're going to go through the wilderness, you're going to go to the cross, you're going to go to the garden. Church of the three, the place where you really want to dwell is the garden. It's the garden. Jesus would sneak away to the garden even though ministry was so desperately needed. He'd sneak away to the garden because he knew the garden was the key to his success. He knew the garden was the key to staying one with the Father. He knew the garden was the key to completing the mission. Does anybody remember the old hymn, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses? I love that old hymn. And in the chorus of that hymn, it's so beautiful. The hymn writer says this, And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me i am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known I come to the garden alone <laughs> while the dew is still on the roses. As David said, Lord, early in the morning will I seek you. We go from the wilderness to the cross to the garden to the resurrection. God is good, isn't he? Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I just thank you today for a sobering message that helps us so understand what's going on in our lives. Lord, a sobering message that helps us understand what's going on in the church. Lord, a sobering message that just cuts to the heart and God reveals your will to us. Lord Jesus, I thank you today that in the garden you prayed to the Father three times, may this cup pass from me. Lord, I thank you that Paul prayed before you three times, may this thorn pass from me. And Lord, I thank you in both cases, heaven responded, my grace is sufficient. So Lord Jesus, I ask that in our weakness may you become strong and may you pour out your grace upon us as we're in the garden of Gethsemane. Lord, right now this church is in the garden of Gethsemane. Lord, right now our lives are in the garden of Gethsemane. You're crushing 
and the oil is flowing. And things aren't happening in a way that, that we thought that they would. But yet you see the end from the beginning. And the moment we want to panic, God, you're not panicking because you see what's going to happen. God, we see the next step in front of us. You see the finished product. God, I pray through faith, help us see what you see. God, I pray through suffering, help us live like you lived. God, I pray through resurrection, help us minister like you ministered. And Lord, I pray in the garden, just as you were crushed, may we be crushed. And may the sweet oil flow. Lord, I thank you for this message that you gave us today. Lord, we receive this message with fear and trembling today. Lord, we receive this message in its fullness today. Lord, may this not be a message that's gone by the time we get out to our vehicle and, and exit the property. Lord, may this word today stay with us. God, may we meditate on this word. May you give us dreams about this word. God, may this word change us. For the word of God does not return void. It will accomplish its purpose. Lord Jesus, I declare that this word will accomplish its purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. For, Lord, there's no other name under heaven given to men by which they can be saved but the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen.